Hello and welcome back to Calculus 1 Saturday edition and we are going to talk now about chapter 5. So chapter 5 is named integration where we are going to take the idea of antiderivatives we learned before and um, expand on it. But we are also going to see what these things are good for. Remember how we said that derivatives measure change, right? The limits compute the y value of the function. So they all had, you know, what, what they do, right? They all had the job they had to do and the purpose. So we understood derivatives through that lens of, oh, measuring the change, right? Measuring instantaneous change. And then we dug deeper into it. So now we learned mechanics of integration because it's just backwards derivatives and that was last last lesson now we want to know what these things do and what they do is they compute area under a curve now before you jump and say i don't care about the area i'm going to tell you that that area represents different things in life for instance if you're thinking about population, I can calculate the change of population. Population went up or population went down, depending on what's happening, right? So right after second, uh, second, right after the um, September 11th, right, the um, uh, rate of of newborn babies significantly went down because. People were afraid in the United States and they said, what kind of world we're living in? Do I really bring the child into, you know, the, the crazy world when, you know, these idiots can, can fly the, the, the plane into the building, right? And so on. No one is safe. So that manifested on universities, you know, 18 years later, it manifested on the enrollment in universities because you had physically less kids, right? Which which is uh, what happened uh, the last year. There were there were massive dips, right, in Eastern and and uh, um, like universities in general. But yeah, so you can measure the change in population by looking into derivatives. So you have the population formula, which calculates the population, and then you take the derivative, and that measures the change. So this year, the amount of people went up, or it went it went down and i mean even with covid we are still um, obviously in a positive uh, because the number of, of of deaths did not surpass the did not significantly add to the number of uh, people that die anyway in the united states from all other causes uh in a year 1.5 or 1.6 million people died in uh, 2019 which involves everything the car accidents just like 30,000 uh, heart attack, cancer, when you put all of that stuff on a pile, right? Um, I think 1.5 or 1.6 million people died in 2019. Now we have 200,000 uh, extra, right? But then less driving, less everything. So it might kind of equalize. I, I don't know until we obviously we see the data, uh, which is published next year. But, um, you know, you can measure the change. And that's what the derivatives are good for. Now, integrals, are going to measure accumulation. So integral is not going to ask you for a change in population. Integral is going to calculate how many people you have um, uh, accumulated, right, uh, as the change is happening. So you can also say how much money I accumulated. So not, not what's the difference or how much I grew my wealth or how much I lost. But what is the total wealth? Because the total means add all of the, the money in. So you can talk about the total population. You can talk about this. In physics, you can talk about the energy, right? Energy will be uh, area under the curve. So there is a lot for us to learn from integration. And integrals are used a lot, obviously, because they have a lot of application. So when I say... You know, oh, integrals are, or where you say, integrals just compute area under the curve. Yes, for the purpose of mathematics and calculus, it computes area under the curve. But that area under the curve in 
what you would call the real life examples, right? They manifest as energy in, in, in physics or accumulated wealth in economics, right? Or and politics, or or you know, for biology, the, the, the total population and right and all of that kind of stuff. Now, <clears throat> what are we talking about approximating area under the curve? There are geometrical shapes for which you can calculate uh, area easily because you know formulas like circle and so on. But let's talk about rectangle. So if I have a rectangle like this in the XY coordinate system, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, you will say that area is five times two gives you 10 units squared and you move along with your life. Easy peasy, right? Now you have circle, you have triangle, you have trapezoid, you have like a whole bunch of these shapes. And when you have complex shapes, you break them into smaller shapes and then you still calculate right the the area so if you were to have something that looked like this right you would say okay i can cut the rectangle here i can cut the rectangle here i have a triangle there right so this is four units this is six units and then this is whatever the hell this is this is uh, three units right so all together it's 13 units so it's it's very simple right to do these problems when the shapes are the shapes that you know the formulas for. But my question to you is, what's area under the x squared? Right? And you all of a sudden say, e x squared. Well, that doesn't have these straight edges that I can make my rectangles and triangles. Right? x squared is is this function that it's, that it's curved. And, and to make it matters worse, it goes forever. Oh, area is infinite under it, actually, right? Because it will go forever and ever. So area under this curve will go forever, and area on this side will go forever, and it's infinite. Yes, you're correct. It's infinite. But then I say, how about area under x squared, y equal x squared, on 0 to 4? So 1, 2, 3, 4. So extend this there. And what's the area here? Now, is, is this a triangle? It's not. It's not a triangle, right? Because this is, this is a curve, right? It's a curve. So, hmm. Well, maybe I can call it a triangle. How about if I call it a triangle, right? And if I call it a triangle then I, I can get, with the formula that I know, I can get very close to the actual answer, right, without being at the actual answer. And uh, welcome to the approximations, right? The title of the, the, core, uh, the lesson, right? We are approximating area under the curve because we don't know enough about integrals yet to calculate it exactly. Now, next week, you will be able to calculate this area exactly, right? When we have the next lesson. Today is all about approximations. So let's learn how these approximations work. So approximate area under curve. There we go. Capitalize that. So let's go. I'm going to have some function. Looks like I put root x. It's okay. Let's call it root x. Why not? It is root x. Whatever. Y equal root x. And I want to compute the area And clearly, right, this is not something that I can um, fit in those shapes that I know. And I want to do that on, let's say, 0 to, to 5. 
So how would I calculate this area? Okay, well, let's be creative. If I can solve the function, can I make it somehow easier for me to solve it? Well, I'm going to partition this function at every one of these integers. So here's my 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. And then I'm going to say left-hand approximation. Use left corner of each rectangle. Well, that's the left corner, and that's going to create a zero rectangle. That's the left corner creates this rectangle. That's the left one. That's the left one. And that's the left one. What you see here are five rectangles, if you want to call this a rectangle, which is nothing there. <laughs> five rectangles that are related to my root x, and I can use them actually to approximate. Now, I'm going to have error. See, all of this is not going to be counted. All of this is not going to be counted. This, this, and that. That is going to be error. Now, there are ways to reduce that error. That's going to be a little bit later in this lecture. But for now, what I see in this picture is that I can calculate the function at each of these red dots, which will give me the height. And I see that my width is always one unit, right? Because each one of these uh, rectangles is one unit wide, right? That's the amount from one to two, from two to three, three to four. So use the left corner of each rectangle to compute f of x. So, we have the area will be approximated with the left-hand area, and that left-hand area is going to be 1 times f at 0 plus 1 times f at 1 plus 1 times f at 2 plus 1 times f at 3 plus 1 times f at 4. You do not have f at f5 because there is no rectangle to the right of it. Think, if you're doing a left-hand approximation, the rectangle is to the right of the left point. For left point approximation, for the left point approximation, the rectangle is to the right of the point because this is the left point this is the right point and if you're using the left point your rectangle is to the right so if i and i also already have i don't know why is this this is not supposed to be red there we go so I used, I used this, maybe I should, let me just put this a little bit and put it in the same line. There we go, that goes right here. Yeah, do this in your notebook. One, two, three, four, five. Five rectangles from the picture, right? 
Now, plug everything in. Now, 1 times, blah, 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 who cares? AL is equal to square root of 0 plus square root of 1 plus square root of 2 plus square root of 3 plus square root of 4, which is 0 plus 1 plus 1.4 plus 1.7 uh, plus 2. I'm approximating. I don't need the 17 decimals on this. I don't care. All right. So AL is going to be 24567.1. Yeah, good enough. So area is about 7.1. This is the squiggly equal sign means approximating. Look, this is area, not the left or right area, just area. So area is about 7.1. I know that the true area is bigger than 7.1. I know that too. Because look, there are these blue regions. The blue regions are uh, all of the area that I didn't account for. So I just left it there, right? Now, <clears throat> same graph. Same graph, but done with the right approximations. I mean, right hand approximation. One, two, three, four, five. Still your root x. Nothing changed there. <clears throat> now, these are the right points. And now we make the rectangles. I hope you see that we still get error, but now I am not undershooting, I'm overshooting. So in this case, the true area is smaller than the approximating area, where in this case here, Come on. True area is more than the left area. Because see, the left area, first of all, the first one is zero. Like, that's the most er error comes from there, right? Now, looking at the second one, again, the first one is the, where the most error is. So now I'm using the right points which means that my area will be approximated by area from the right. And that is given by one times. So I'm calculating now at these points. So that's my square root of one, square root of two, and so on. So one times square root of one plus one times square root of two plus one times square root of three plus one times square root of four. Come on, tablet. Plus. 1 times square root of 5. Again, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. 5 rectangles. Now, you don't see a 0. Why don't you have a 0? Well, if you wanted to have a 0 as well, then you better have the rectangle uh, to the left of it. Because if we are using right points, then the rectangle is to the left of the right point. And zero doesn't have anything to the left of it. So we can't use the right point approximation on zero. Now, this will be sorted in your head. If you're confused now, it will be sorted in your head when you start drawing these things. Uh, now we still have 1 plus 1.4 plus 1.7 plus 2 plus 2.2. So those are all approximations for these, these values. And I have 2, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 1, 8, 3. Okay. So area is approximated by 8.3, but I also know that the true area is less than 8.3. So by doing both calculations, I know that the true area is somewhere in between 7. Point whatever the hell was 7.1 and 8.3 that's where the true area is you can take the average of these two numbers right 
and uh, was that come up with a 7.6 uh, or 7.7 7.7 so come up with 7.7 and um, you know that might be even closer which again we are upgrading these lectures in calc 2 so you are going to have uh, better approximation methods than these two that we are learning in this class <clears throat> so we have this idea and guys this is just like middle school stuff you're you're looking for the area of the rectangle we didn't do any derivatives or integrals or anything like that right you you take your function and you partition it on the grid that it's given to you right and that grid that partition is what you make it to be like i wanted to put the partition to be one and we partition it at one and that's why it's one times because each one of these rectangles that you see on the picture here right each one of these rectangles is going to be one for a and then f at whatever point you had it for b and then a times b now let's write some mathematical notation here so i'm going to have some function f of x and i'm going to partition somewhere and this is what i'm partitioning x0 x1 x2 x3 <coughs> So now, for this particular situation, let's let's have x4 as well. It's okay. So look, five points for rectangles. You will never be using all five points here in Calc 1 to compute these areas. So your left approximation is when the points are at on the left i am not going to place the last point up there because on, on the x4 because again left meaning that the rectangle is to, to the right of you and x4 does not have rectangle to the right of it so left area is going to be now guys we're going to call this delta x this difference here because we learned that delta x is x x1 minus x0. Now, better yet to write it is xn minus xn minus 1. Or xn plus 1 minus xn. So, computer science people are now like, yes, finally, some cool stuff. Um, so, your discrete notation here xn represents x0, x1, x2, x3, x4, and so on. So we have all of these delta x's. And see, I, I'm going to compute a function at x0 and function at x1 and function at x2 to get these heights and function at x3. So this is delta x times f of x0 plus delta x times f of x1 plus delta x times f of x2. And finally, delta x times f of x3. And you see that you can factor out delta x because they all have the same delta x uh, partition. They don't have to, but for convenience, you should choose that. I mean, that, dare I say, should be common sense. So now you have just f of x0 plus f of x1 plus f of x2 plus, for this problem, f of x3. But in all reality, I don't know how many rectangles you have, right? So that's that's that part. Now, as a contrast, immediately, AR. 
it's going to be the same except you are skipping the first point and you are including the new one on the end. And I hope you can connect all of this with the picture you see up there. Right? So the blue ones are now going to be um, the right points, which means rectangles are to the left. So it's going to be this is one, this is the one, this is the one, and this is the one. Right? And then you can see right, that you are involving now this fifth point, which is x4. Cool. And now, as long as you compute the function, the value in the function, you should be able to approximate area under the curve. Now the question is error. And for that, we'll need a little bit better picture. So I'm still going to go with the same, which is going to make it a little bit larger. Still going to go with pretty much the same function, except now my um, divisions here are going to be it's still one unit. But now look at this. If I go and use the left approximation, we have all of this error. And we understand that already because none of this stuff is accounted for. Right, so that's your error. And this is when n is equal to 4, which means 4 rectangles. Now, the first one is labeled as x0, x1, x2, and blah, blah, blah. I don't need that now. What I'm going to do is I'm going to say, well, how about, what if we have, or we had, eight rectangles? Well, those would then cut halfway. So now I also have it at half, at 1.5, 2.5, 3.5, right? And if I do the left points now, we eliminated this as error, this as error, this as error, and a little bit of over here. You see that we eliminated a lot of error by doubling the number of rectangles. You don't have to double it, just have more than what you had before. And if you have more rectangles, then the error is going to drop. Okay, now what does that mean for our calculations? Well, it means more calculations which is why we want to program this. We don't want to do it by hand. And by the way, eventually you'll figure it out that when you ask your software to integrate and give you a number, uh, this is what it does over like 10,000 rectangles. So yeah. So now what we discovered here, we discovered here that the old delta x, the black delta x, there was one, is now turning into a purple delta x, which is a half. 
Each one of these delta x's is a half now. And you would say, well, can we easily figure this out for everyone? Well, yeah. All you need to do is to take the entire interval and divide by how many rectangles you have. Right? If you take the interval, which is b minus a, and you divide it by the number of rectangles that you want to split it in, you will get your delta x. That creates the formula for delta x. And delta x is in your function for approximation. I don't care whether you're using al or right, a is approximated by al, and al is delta x uh, times f of x0 plus f of x1 plus dot 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 how many you have. Area can also be approximated with the right points by the same delta x, but now you're starting at x1. So there is a very easy way for you to figure out what your delta x is. And it's just very simple in terms of you're subtracting uh, b minus a. So if I wanted n equals 4 on interval 0 to 4, I just have delta x is 4 minus 0 over 4 equals 1. That was our old delta x. Or you want 8 rectangles on 0 to 4. Well, delta x is 4 minus 0 divided by 8, which is a half. So it's very easy to calculate what delta x is, right? And delta x can be a fraction, can be integer, whatever it needs to be. And over here, to add to this approximation mess, more rectangles means less error, but it also means more calculations. So you say, okay, I'm calculating this by hand. So I'm going to do five rectangles, six rectangles or something. Or I'm going to, instead of, you know, wasting 15 minutes of my life computing those six calculations by hand, how about I invest those 15 minutes and program this, right? And then have computer do 10,000 calculations. You see, so, so this is why this computer science is crushing everything, why there's 100,000 jobs available, why are the salaries high, and so on, right? Because... You know, computer science allows you to be this lazy, right? Instead of investing time in calculating one case, you invest the same time to write the code that will compute every case you think up with far better precision than you ever would by hand. So if you at ever point oppose coding and computers, you must lose unless like the let's say solar flare right deletes the entire computational base of the planet right killing all of the electrical devices in which case we go back to stone age right because the difference between us now and us you know prior to to calculus is exactly calculus which gave rise to eventually to computers so that we can make robots, which are factories, which is producing technically everything, right? Produces the cars and, and, and everything. I don't need to give examples. So we would be able to program this using like a loop, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because, uh, that'll be my, my next project. <laughs> yeah. Well, you first have the Newton's, Newton's method. Yeah. <laughs> but see, the, the idea is to try and program as soon, as soon. As you see a formula 
that involves a subscript, x0, x1, x2, that's the first thing you do, programming, right? And you are going yeah. to have numerical approximations, right, for a lot of stuff. You had the Newton's method, now you have these uh, integrals over here, then you are going to have sequences of series, the calc 3 is going to have uh, the stuff as well, then you go to differential equations, you're going to learn Euler's method, improved Euler's, Runge-Kada method, numerical methods for approximations. You instantly program them all, because that is going to be that knowledge of you being able to program those 10 lines, right? Because it's a loop, it's a for loop, just go, right? Uh, you can do while as well, I mean, whatever. Um, so being able to program this line is in 10 lines, it's infinitely more productive and better than knowing how to compute them by hand. Because we always go to the software because we are lazy. And we should be lazy because I'm going to take 15 minutes to compute 10 cases and the computer is going to take tenth of a second to calculate 10,000. And that result is always going to be, this is why I say, right, the knowledge makes you indispensable, right, in the company and no one cares if you ever be able to differentiate integrate. Because we have a $300 computer to integrate, right? Your knowledge of integration is completely relevant in engineering setting. The question is, can you model and can you program to do the simulations? Can you work in a team? Can you communicate your ideas, right? Can you write up the report and the proposal, right? Those are the important skills. And yes, I know I teach calculus and I am kind of bringing the whole, <laughs> the whole thing down, like <laughs> that you will never differentiate and integrate by hand. But yeah, that's, you know, that's attributed to education and, and stuff that we do wrong. But the thing is, um, any time, guys, when you see the subscripts, um, know immediately that you are in the realm of discrete mathematics, which means you can use the computer to program it and not have to worry. Now, obviously, right, you, in, in order to program something like this, you need to have a variable for, for delta x. You can call that age, right? You can ask for input. You can hard code your function. That, that's going to be easy, right? But ask for an input. Ask for how many rectangles. Ask for the, for the interval. Let the, user, let the user put the interval in and maybe have a code for x squared, have a code for root x, or maybe have them in the same code and have the people choose one, two, three, four, which one they want to use. I mean, I don't know, but the trick is you can be so much, so creative with all of these things, uh, but writing that loop and understanding, right, that we have to compute the function at the first point, right, so now, oh, I need an array to, to sort all of the x values and, and y values, right, because I need to add all the y values, so, so I need a multidimensional array and so on. If you talk Java, for instance. Most people talk Java, Python is better, but... <laughs> yeah, I'm, right now I'm only learning Java. I know. Do the Java. Do the Java for this, because it, it's not going to take you much to, to transfer it to Python. It's just that the industry is using Python more now. Java is still stronger. Java is still everywhere, but the industry is switching switching to Python. And uh, um, once, you, once you take both programming languages, you will understand why. Um, uh, and all, they're always better, right? Some things that are better with Java, some things that are better than Python. But if you're going to do robotics, you're going to stick with Python. OK. So, are there uh, any other programs you would recommend to, uh, oh, C++, I guess, newly... assembly? I mean, you, you so have... like new beginners? Beginners? Yeah, it's like people just getting into uh, programming. Oh, I would immediately say just go Python right away. Immediately go into Python. And then fill in the blanks as, as necessary. Because there are certain levels of programming that are better to do directly on the hardware. So you don't want Python or Java there because they have compilers and a whole bunch of other stuff that, that, that go on top of it. Right? So... So certain things, you know, you want to learn assembly, you want to learn, you know, C++, um, 
some of this lightweight stuff. But then the complicated software, you, you don't want to run in C++. <laughs> you know, that's, that's another thing, right? So you want to have object-oriented programming like Java, right? Then you also want to have a machine language <laughs> knowledge as well. And the amount of the stuff you know determines your value on the market. So if you have no knowledge of programming whatsoever, I would say even if, if you like, let's say, video games, uh, learn how to script for for Unity, let's say for for VR or something. It's it's a joke, right? Or to make a video game uh, of of very basic uh, very basic things. I mean, I was thinking to kind of give some workshops or stuff for 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 that because the the stuff is really joke. Plus, everything is available to learn online. You don't need a class, right? You can learn uh, you can learn everything on on YouTube. Um, it is so easy, and if you start, you know, scripting, and once that, once it hits you with that creativity and things you can do, uh, I would still go, you know, say go into Python, uh, and a lot of stuff is, is is Python related. But then again, Java is going to have a huge. I mean, Java is still much bigger than Python, but Python is the one that it's that it's catching up, and it's and it's better for industry, so industry is pushing it, and. Um, just look look at the memes, right? Usually that's where you find all of the answers, uh, the way the, the the situation actually is in the world. Um, no news outlets are going to <laughs> to give you better state of of the world and matter than the memes, right? So look memes Java versus Python and, and yeah, I, I <laughs> I've seen a lot of Java versus Python memes and there's like you know uh, a a quick you know a couple lines of, of code to do something in Java and then they'll like compare it in Python and it's like one line and it just like Python just like makes it a lot more simpler in the uh, yeah a lot and of as I said aspects. right you are going it's it's like think about gas power cars and electric cars right where, where Python is electric car right so that's that's technically right so so industry wants now electric cars and everyone is developing electric cars and they are vastly better than gas power cars uh, order of magnitude better. Like people say, oh, they're green. Hell no, they're not green. That the, the environmental impact is is the same or worse because all of the electricity we produce is still uh, thermonuclear plants, thermal plants, and you know all of that stuff. And and the stuff they waste time with with uh, windmills and and solar panel nonsense and all of that stuff that it's actually worse for the environment than they advertise uh, is all nonsense. So. Electric cars are not green. They are not green in that aspect that they are using green energy because they are not. The only thing that's going to give you green energy is fusion. Now that's 20 years out until ITAR is is completed uh, in France and and has the 10-1 ratio. Blah blah blah. You can research uh, ITAR project and you'll know what I'm talking about. So when you have a fusion, you are going to put in. Um, Hydrogen on one end, get all the electricity, and as the byproduct, what spits out on the other end is distilled water and helium for balloons for parties, so everyone is happy. Uh, that fixes the entire environmental issue of the planet. So all of this nonsense going on now about, is there global warming? Yes. Is it measured? Yes. Is it a problem? Yes. Is it going to be solved by these idiots going around chanting and ranting? No. No. Is it going to be solved by windmills and solar panels? Hell no, because they make situation worse on top of being terrible to produce, terrible to dispose, terrible to you know throw away and all that stuff, killing birds and, and, and wildlife, taking way too much space, right? It's the, probably the, the, the most retarded solution I've heard for energy crisis, solar panels and windmill, and I'm going to sign that statement. Well, actually, here now it's on YouTube video, so <laughs> there you go. Uh, it's the most retarded solution, and I chose my word carefully because I'm implying low IQ, okay, on on the solution to the crisis of energy. Um, fusion is the only solution to the energy crisis. That's it. There's nothing else. Just fusion. You put hydrogen on one end, you get water. <laughs> <laughs> and this still as a byproduct, so no issues for the environment, and uh, you get all of the electricity you want. In that point, electric cars become energy as well, green. 
The reason why electric car now is green is because of its efficiency. The gas-powered cars are about 25 to 27% efficient, which means the quarter of the money you put in for the gas tank is the, is the money that drives you from point A to point B until you spend all of the fuel and runs your air conditioning and music and everything in the car. Quarter. So $40, $40 tank, $10 is you driving, and, and $30 $30 is wasted energy in noise, heat, friction of the mechanical parts in the engine and all of that nonsense. Where the electric car, Tesla, is 98% efficient. So pretty much 100% of money you pay for electricity to drive it. Is you, so so there, is no, there is no waste. That's why electric cars are four times, at least four times, but argue it 10 times better than the, the gas-powered cars. So this is what you have to, what you have to think about as well. And um, yeah, there you go. I have no clue how we got to this point, but maybe if you go back in a video, like one thing goes to another. Um, going back to the lecture, guys, what you see on the screen right now is literally everything you need to know to approximate area under the curve uh, by... Um, left and right hand sums. All you need to do is partition your function between the two numbers A and B they give you in the interval and you decide uh, how many rectangles, how many calculations you want to do. If you let the software do it, maybe you want to put 10,000, it's okay, right? Software is still going to get it under a second. Well, given what processor you run. But um, it's still going to be very quick. The more rectangles, we have seen that in this picture, because if I go and I put even more rectangles here, right, if I go like this, we... then I eliminated this part. And if I go, then I eliminated that part, right? So you can see how tiny, 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 right? Because this part over here is eliminated. So the error that used to be this rectangle, the, the, the highlighted blue error, once I took to have like eight times more, right, turns into this little tiny error uh, rectangle right up there that you can barely even see, right? And now... You go and, and you zoom zoom out to show the whole function, and you don't even see it. So that's the power of, of having more calculations. But again, having more calculations is more time, more computing, right? So that's why we want to program this. Yeah, so if you are programming it and you know you're doing it, you know, a thousand or ten thousand times, it wouldn't really matter if you used uh, left hand or right hand, right? Yes, exactly. Okay. You are going to see a slight difference in the whatever decimal you can display, right? Use the float. But the thing is, um, you are not going to see it on the on the ten thousand, right? Um, but it's very interesting to take the same hard coded function, right, to make it easy, and you can even hard code the interval. Just ask me how many rectangles do I want, right? Just just ask me one thing. You know, don't don't even ask about interval. You can, because then you can learn as a calculus one student, right? You you have the software you wrote, took you 15 minutes, whatever, and now this you know blinking on a screen asking for input and you put four, you get a number, then you run it again, and you put 10, and run it again, put 100, run it again, put a thousand, and then take those four answers and compare them. Right, and in that case, you would see exactly what it means. Now, you can also go on the internet and ask what is the exact area, you know, under the curve, and blah blah blah. The software will recognize integration and things that we are going to learn next class, and you will be able to compare the numbers you got through your software to the ones that the computer uh, on the software spit out, and you'll find out that the one with 10,000 rectangles is the same, <laughs> right. So, so yeah, that's that's that part. So the more calculations, the better the precision, but then more calculations. 
And what ties into the whole story is still the story of you simplifying your functions algebraically as far as possible. Because remember now, if your calculation has two extra steps that are unnecessary steps algebraically, that you could rewrite the function in a way where those steps are eliminated, then your 10,000 um, point calculation has extra 20,000 calculations to do, which is why someone else's software is better because their algebra was better than yours. It'd be more optimized. Yes, I was about to say that's called optimization. <laughs> and, to it. Right? And that's, yes, that's called optimization. And uh, that's what optimized software runs faster. So when, you know, they introduce new graphics card and they push it out on the market and not just a reference, but, you know, other companies go in and they make the, the cards and you buy the graphics card, right? You spend like 600 bucks. And two weeks later, there is an update for a driver. Like, why? Why would you update driver ever? It was working the first time around. Oh, computer science folks figure out that they can simplify this, simplify that, simplify this, made, made it more stable, made it faster, made it, right? AMD has that a lot. When, when they push their first, <laughs> first round of drivers, is usually really, really bad, right? But then, uh, but then, you know, a few weeks later, they have updates and everything's optimized and then it and it works really really well so you know uh, making the, the software work like this now we have a little bit more to talk about uh, which is uh, something that will set up our next class and that is uh, this so you have seen these symbols uh, this is summation notation and this literally means addition. So it's it's this kind of weird E. It's not really E, but it looks like like it's E, but it's not. Okay, so it's it's a Greek Greek letter, and it stands for addition. So if I want to write um, two plus two plus two plus two plus two. I can just write add two five times. So this number here, i equals one through five, is a counter. And this is the formula that you are executing. So if I want to say 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5, I can write that as summation of i, where i goes from 1 to 5. So when i is 1, we plug in 1, and that's 1. Then on the next run around, and we put plus because it's summation. By the way, there is another one that looks like this. i goes from 1 to 3 for i, which would give you 1 times 2 times 3. So when you put the pi, it's multiplication. When you put sum, it's addition. So that's, you know, I just want to toss that in so you know that because it's i, it's 1. And then because it's summation, it's um, plus, I mean. So first time around, you're starting at i equals 1. Okay, i equals 1, i equals 1. Then summation is a plus. Okay, we got a plus. And then the next time around, after i equals 1, it's i equals 2, because these are integer increments. Okay, so now i equals to 2, so that's the next number. And then 3, 4, and then it ends at 5, which is on the top. So plus 3, plus 4, plus 5. So what is summation of i squared minus 4 when i goes from 8 to 10? Well, that's simple. We are starting at 8 squared minus 4. We are adding the 9 squared minus 4. And we are adding the 10 squared minus 4. So, i is equal to 8, and that's where we start. And we count every integer until we have to stop. 
and uh, the, the, the number you see on the top is the last number that you have to use. So you can see 8, 9, and 10 replacing that i. Go ahead, compute, right? 64 minus 40, 60, 81 minus 40, 78, uh, 77, right? So you can go and compute and get the number at the end. But that's, that's something that will we'll need this notation. It's called summation notation. Um, I can have <coughs> i start at 1, goes to 3, of x squared plus 4. Well, there is no i over here. So it's just x squared plus 4 plus x squared plus 4 plus x squared plus 4. Because, uh, sorry, let's do minus. I wanted minus. Sorry, 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 sorry. Why minus? Because I wanted to look the same as the, the problem above. <laughs> so do you see how because i matched i, I had 8, 9, 10. But now i and x do not match. I don't get to plug in i equals 1 into x. No. Right? It's x squared, x squared, x squared. The same thing like when you had that limit where h goes to 0, but you have x's inside. Right? So you end up with limit h goes to 0 of 1 over x plus h squared and you just said oh that's 1 over x squared because age went to 0 limit of age goes to 0 only impacts age does not impact x at all well the same thing with the summation notation your i equals 1 only impacts i's but i don't have any i's therefore boom 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 right copy the same thing uh, three times and move along so this actually has a double purpose. One is counting on how many terms you're going to have. The other one is if your formula depends on that i, then that value gets to change as well. But if it's some different variable, it doesn't get to change. Just like in the limit. You never bother this x here. And you'll have that in Calc 2 as well, obviously. Actually, all of these concepts in Calc 2 are going to combine uh, together anyway. So this uh, summation notation is going to play a, a major role in us understanding what the um, what this uh, integration means and what what it, it is. But now with the summation notation, I can I can rewrite my formulas. See, I can go and I can say delta x is b minus a over n, where n is the number of rectangles. And then my area is approximated by area to the left, which is delta x times the summation of all functions that are starting, right, at xn, where n is starting at 1, and it's going to, uh, sorry, i is, this is xi. There we go. So xi. And if you stop for a second to think about this, right? Remember when we had, let's say, so if you if you want to, uh, let me write the other one. So ar is going to be delta x times summation. i is going to start. So left, oh, left starts at 0, goes to n minus 1. Oops. And uh, over here, this one starts at 1 and goes to 1. <laughs> this is called debugging. Okay. Uh, I just debugged my, my formula up there. Um, so now these are the same formulas that I had previously written in red, except now they're using the summation notation. Um, so if I have an example now. Oops. I have an example here. It's going to take 10 seconds. 1, 2, 3, 4. Right? I have my root x. 
So my delta x is 4 minus 0 over 4, giving me 1. And I have my f of xi, right, to be a square root of xi, because that's my square root of function. So my area is approximated by area to the left, which is delta x times summation. And my i for the left point starts at 0 and ends at 3 of f of xi. Now, if you want to write it out, you can. Delta x. And now what do I have? i equals 0. That's f of x is 0. Plus, the next time around, i is 1 f of x1, plus f of x2, and the last one, f of x3. You see how the top was n minus 1? Your n was 4, because you wanted 4 rectangles, right? So n minus 1 on top, and that's what you see here, n minus 1. But you started at 0, so you're counting that 0 in. One of the most confusing things in computer science, right, that arrays start with a value of zero. I mean, counter for the array starts at a value of zero. So a lot of bugs on homework, right, are the issue when you pick the wrong wrong cell because, right, when you, when you make an array, the first is x0, then x1, then x2. So the first one is this, the second one is that, the third one is this, so they're off by one. Welcome to Java. So... So when you when you do this over here, right, you have n minus 1. So 0 is the first one. And if you do the right ones, so approximated by r, then it's delta x, summation i starts at 1 and goes to 4 of f of x i. And then you have the, the exact formula we had before, except Again, you had a way to compress it. Right. So it's just like a lazy notation. You can think of it that way as well. So f of x1 plus f of x2 plus f of x3 plus f of x4. Boom. And I stop at that last value. So this is just a way to compress in this lecture. The next lecture, we are going to uh, use this uh, knowledge and expand a little bit more on it. There are some formulas that we will be using, but yeah, uh, we are actually going to define area under the curve as the as the definite integral, and that's going to be next class using the notation here. Uh, the homework and the lab and all that stuff will be posted, so you guys can practice and enjoy. Now uh, we do have few minutes. Do you guys have any questions, concerns, anything regarding 5.1? <clears throat> okay, if there are no questions, then um, if you think about something, uh, join the office hours. Uh, office hours will start in about five minutes, and the link is in Canvas. I will see you all. Oh, you 